hi what's up everyone it's me karen your favorite booktuber and this is my second attempt at this video let's hope this one's a little bit better today we're gonna be doing my november favorites okay my november favorites let's see quick highlights the last day of the month i happened to cross the threshold of 100 books i'm gonna have to say i'm really thankful for Pluck, shout out Pluck. It is because of them that I finally, I think, made 100 books in a year. And I think the reason for that is because of the fact that there are so many people in Pluck who read way more than I do and they really encouraged me. And just just by virtue of the fact that they're reading so many books and shout out Pluck. All right, diving right into it. Also gonna have to say November, there was a lot of nonfiction reads because it was nonfiction November and we love to see it. So the first book that I read was When Mackenzie Comes to Town. This is investigative journalism on, you guessed it, Mackenzie. So Mackenzie, for those of you that don't know, is like a big four consulting firm. I might've made that up. I just throw around big four because people seem to talk about it a lot. I think, who else is big four? EY? Procter and Gamble and the third one the forgotten one I don't even know if those four three of the four that I mentioned are part of big four but I think that they are anyway so this book is talking about when Mackenzie comes to town and what happens when they enter into an industry and most likely the thing that they recommend is that you decimate a lot of the workload by doing that the workforce rather by doing that you're actually then increasing profits for stakeholders and um investors but it's kind of a false uh, promise because you do increase your profits but it's not a very inventive or innovative way to increase the bottom line and to really be growing and scaling so it kind of sets them up for failure because the workforce that you are locked with is probably very competent but is also then overworked and will probably start looking for other options and places. What you see from this book is that McKenzie is a company and institution that has been around for a while. They do have values, but a lot of their business practices, the companies that they work for is shrouded in secrecy. And as a result of that, they've done some kind of shady things. One of the things that they do, which is quite common in their business practice is that they will work with in the same industry with clients, some of whom are competitors with each other and just go at it with the promise that those teams don't interact at all, but it's still kind of shady. And a lot of the times they are giving a lot of the same advice to both of these companies. And I just think what you'll see when you read this book, you will probably go away from it being like a lot of what the authors, not a lot, but you do get the slight impression that the argument that the authors are making isn't entirely sound, but you kind of get what they're saying and what they're putting down because a lot of these big corporations are pretty shady, but it was very interesting. You see Mackenzie's work in the tobacco industry in, um, finance not well finance yeah sure but the opiate industry they worked a lot with purdue pharma which as we know sacklers bad not good they also worked a bit with what is that called when you pay someone and something bad happens to your house and they pay you insurance <laughs> they worked with the insurance industry and really changed how a lot of modern day insurance looks. It's a result of the things that they were doing. Anyways, Mackenzie, not good. Book interesting, might be a fan. You might be interested if you're interested in business and America. Then moving on from there, the final, uh, my fantasy books for the month, I read Inheritance, which was part of my effort to reread The Inheritance Cycle by Christopher Paolini in anticipation of the release of the new, new Mirtag. Inheritance, I don't really have much to say. It's a reread. I don't think most of you guys who are watching the channel are really that interested in my fantasy reads. So we'll just move on to Mirror Tag for the people who are interested. This book, the highly anticipated book, was a little disappointing for me. I would have to say that on one hand, it was lovely and incredible to return to the world of Aragon and find out more backstory on Mirror Tag, but as a whole, it was kind of not that great of a read, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I almost don't even want to go into it too much because I kind of feel bad. But the first 100 pages are kind of a snooze fast and then you have about 100 pages, which are kind of interesting because Mirtag is performing a quest on behalf of the Werecats and that's interesting. You get some good kind of like cool little details. But then from there, things take a turn, a massive turn because Mirtag somehow decides that even though he has literally no magic training and is so weak in comparison to Aragorn's training, that he is going to go to where the dragons told him not to go at the end of the fourth book and he goes up to those islands and finds out that there's basically like this weird dreamer cult and gets brainwashed 
and can't do anything and basically experiences once again the plight of having someone else be your master which is what happened to him with Galbatorix when Galbatorix knew his true name and so you have to suffer through what feels like most of the book of hearing how he gets abused by that crazy lady and it's just not that cool and I would have to say on one hand I appreciated that you know the the lore of this place is very different I would say from what we got in the prior four books it's not very based in Lord of the Rings like mythos but the evil in this in this book she is very similar to Galbatorix and on that front, I would have to say that I feel, feel like Paolini does not write strong villains. And I would have to say that probably is a really hard thing to do, right? But for some reason, both this woman and Galbatorix just feel the same. They're like fanatics who uh, appear to be very like alluring, charismatic, but then so quickly, so fast, you just find out that they're raving lunatics. And it's just not that interesting to read. So that was that book. I did think it was kind of cool to get a bit more about Miratag and his spare time. He likes to write poems and is really adept at ballroom dancing and him and Thorne have an interesting bond and you just feel really bad for Thorne because Thorne really suffered under Galbatorix and I'm just going to wrap that up there. We're going to move on to the next book. I did a reread of Eileen, Eileen by Otessa Moshvig in anticipation, ooh, in anticipation of the film being released on December 7th. Hopefully I will be watching it on December 7th or maybe December 8th. I did this on audio and I would have to say that the second time around it's interesting I think if you've not read it before you'll probably enjoy it because it is quite um, compelling you know Eileen's a really weird character and one of the details that I kept on thinking about after this reread was how Eileen drops this line that sometimes when she's at work when she gets too titillated she would go into a spare room pinch her nipples and kick her legs up into the air and I just think that's so weird <laughs> and I've like thought about it a few times because I'm like who in their right mind thinks of this so yeah I would have to say that you know the first 80% of the book nothing really happens you are just there for the ride and for the details and it's interesting because the narrator of Eileen is Eileen at a much later age, probably in her late 70s, late 80s, and she's recounting her early adulthood, her transition from, you know, a weak, simpering lady and young woman into a woman who is creating a life of her own in New York. And you get a lot of, well, when I was that age, and I think it's just a lot of anticipation and a lot of buildup. And we could have cut like about half of those references to her being like back then, blah, 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 this, that, the other thing. But I would have to say is that the last 20% of the book is I think the most engaging, obviously, because if you've read the book, you kind of already know. But I think it's that Eileen's analysis of upper middle class families and how upper middle class people feel very entitled to getting their hands dirty but actually not really being willing to do that as you'll see in the case of like what Rebecca ends up doing and how she's incapable of actually executing on what she wanted to do. I think those observations on families, middle class families versus like Eileen's own family is really interesting. Next up I read Back to Nonfiction. We have The Gospel of Wellness by Rena Raphael. We're looking at The Gospel of Wellness and our author is exploring why the wellness industry is so prominent, such a big deal in America, especially why it holds such a big um, sway on predominantly upper middle class, wealthy white women. And what to say about this book? On one hand, I did think it, I said on one hand quite a bit. It was an interesting read. However, I feel like I'm really well versed in this space of wellness, boutique fitness. Uh, Goop has been on my radar for a long time. I've worked with like beauty wellness brands before. So I just felt like I knew a lot of this stuff and a lot of the observations that were being made were kind of obvious to me. And I don't think that they necessarily like carried the gravitas that it might have to someone else who might not be as aware of this industry. But what you can say is that it's a $4.4 billion industry. I was telling one of my friends this and they were like, it's probably more than that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. It probably is way more than that. But a lot of the author's um, takeaways is kind of that the general public is not very well informed on parsing through the copy that is used to sell these products. So a lot of the times you will receive things that sound very convincing, very helpful, that it would help you in your whatever problems you're facing, whether that's a, like your 
really stressed so you think you have high cortisol levels and your adrenals are tapped which is something that i remember seeing quite a bit on tiktok and even before tiktok and instagram people were always talking about adrenal fatigue self-diagnosing themselves and so that you will find that you can get like powders from moon juice and other places that will like help you but the claims that they put on the packaging has to be kind of vague that it will get past you know fda and whatever and like won't actually strike the ire of the government but still is convincing and tantalizing enough for a regular consumer to purchase it and then a lot of what she's saying is that like women aren't believed by the medical professionals what i did really like about this book was when the author would give us um details from way back in american culture about how running wasn't a thing until the 70s and people who were running in the suburbs the police would pull them over and be like what are you doing this is weird like are you good? <laughs> so I found those kind of details. Like another example was how the founder of the Graham Cracker was this American guy and a reverend in Massachusetts who was basically telling people that you should be making your own food. And he suggested the Graham Cracker back. It wasn't as good as it is now. And I really liked those details and seeing how just a desire for wellness, self-improvement has always been a part of American culture. And I wish we had more of those examples and that's that next up i read the jakarta method by vincent bevins now this book is looking at jakarta and how the anti-communist sentiments of america and the cia worked to kind of create this these mass murder programs which were first seen in jakarta and later seen in other parts of the world where communism was considered a threat so you would see that in latin america and other parts of the world i would say that this book was really harrowing, very upsetting, and a really intense read, but very informative. After that, I read Travels with Myself and, and Another by Martha Gellhorn. Uh, Martha Gellhorn, for those of you who don't know, you would have found this out if you read my newsletter. She was uh, Hemingway's third wife, and she really detested when people would describe her like that, so we're not gonna spend too much time on her relationship with Hemingway, but she was also a war correspondent, an author of her own, and she was a really, competent not even competent she was great at both of those she was the only woman present at d-day she had she was supposed to have a press pass but hemingway stole them and he was stuck on a boat with all the other journalists however she used her charisma and her charm and ability to talk to people to get herself onto a hospital boat and as a result of that she was on on, on the ground actually helping to transfer soldiers who were struck down and because of that she wrote a really great article so she wrote travels with myself and another i think when she was in her 70s looking back at some of her travels and she kind of starts with the premise that most people don't like to hear about travel stories like they don't actually care if you had a nice pleasant trip they are sometimes intrigued when you have a horror story like a horrible experience so she decides to dive deep into that she's looking at her trip to china she went to the caribbean in the beginning of the war and where else did she go she went to Russia for one week, one week in Moscow. She went to Africa for like about a three month sojourn, which is really interesting. And I think there's one more place that I'm forgetting, but it was really good because, but there were some issues with it. So I have to say, I enjoyed reading it because you're seeing a time and place in the world which no longer exists. This is travel without smartphones. There's no social media. She has to you know sometimes call the embassy to help her find accommodations she is traveling in unpressurized planes she doesn't really sometimes she'll go to a hotel expecting there to be a place for her there isn't so she ends up staying at a local's house like it's really interesting um part one is her travel to china with hemingway where she basically had to beg him to go with her because he didn't even want to go to china it was not on his radar then they get there and it turns out she hates it she really dislikes her time in china and he's having a blast he loves it and especially you find that he loves chinese food so that was like a cool little detail hemingway is not referred to by his name at all in the book he's known as um uc so in that section of the book hemingway has a line where he says martha loves humanity she just doesn't love people and you kind of find that that it is true she's a very just woman she's very american she feels quite strongly about freedom that people should basically be left to themselves to rule as they see fit but at the same time she is a woman of her time and you will see that there are moments where she says things that are kind of uncomfortable and like weird 
and that especially comes to light when she's in Africa. However, that probably is the strongest section of the book. She basically had gotten paid for some article of $3,000 and she decides to go to Africa because she's like never been before and she's traveling through I think Kenya, Chad, um, maybe one other place and she decides to go on a safari but they won't let her take a car by herself so she has to hire a driver and the driver comes recommended by the embassy but it turns out she literally is like describes meeting him his name is Jonathan and she's like I had a feeling Joshua sorry his name is Joshua she's like I had a feeling that he was not going to be a right fit but I went against my intuition a move I have done over and over again and I hired him and they go off on their safari and he's supposed to be a driver but the man can't drive and at first she's like hey Joshua like why don't you take the wheel I'm feeling a little tired and he's like no ma'am I think you should do it you're a much stronger better driver than I am or like I'll, I'll do it later I'll do it later and then you come to find out he can't drive at all he's afraid of everything every time I see animals he's a scaredy cat he sits at the car and he gets cold in the night and he's always really nervous not very helpful so she kind of starts saying every time he's acting up she'll be like buck up Joshua like buck up and it was so funny so delightful I've actually Think it's such a great response to anything in in the last month every time that i have uh not been strong or brave i've just thought to myself like buck up joshua um i think i said it to someone it's just it's become a bit for me i'm gonna keep running with it it was really great and i think it was just i don't read a lot of travel writing and as i've been doing more travel in the last couple of years i have wondered like how does one keep track of everything you see how a lot of the excursions or experiences that you might have while traveling sometimes can feel really manufactured because we are living in a very globalized world and the tourism industry is quite big for a lot of countries and it's just made me wonder like is it sometimes is there any point in remembering these details and writing them down when it feels so ubiquitous and something that so many people can experience but then I think that like a hundred years from now things could be so different it is worth writing down because reading Martha Gellhorn's experience like her travel is so different than what it would be like to travel to those places now and it is a reason to keep travel writing even though in the moment it might not necessarily feel worth it then with the homies and plaque i did a reread of twilight yeah i know right wild guys i did this for funsies with my friends and it's just a good time to, you know, go back in time and have a little nostalgia read for the vibes. Then I did Clean by James Hamblin, which is another nonfiction book. This is about the science of skin and it starts with James Hamblin being like, when I was in medical school or just recently graduated med medical school, I decided to stop showering. Whoa, bam, starts off guns blazing. And he's basically like, people thought that I was doing it to save water, to be more of an environmentalist. And he's like, that's great that they would think that, but I kind of felt a little bit ashamed because that's not why I did it. I did it because I wanted to save time because showering takes up so much time. And so he then goes into the science of skincare, looking at uh, soap, the rise of soap, um, the different ways that the soap industry has changed and the kind of manipulative language that the industry will use even though all soap is basically made up of the same composition and we find out that soap operas like daytime soaps came from uh radio shows back in the day and radio shows were an opportunity for these soap industries to advertise their companies and their soap brands whatever and that's just like a a leftover of that that then made its way over to soap operas and we still just say that and that comes from the soap industry which I found was really interesting so there's like lots of great details like that we see how cleanliness is something that came about as a de desire to like mitigate disease and you know plagues and that kind of stuff but how it also does play into uh, class and our assumptions of you know a good person it was really interesting I would definitely give it a read I think I thought that there would be way more observations about like current skincare per se but there wasn't really like there's a section about like Glossier and I just thought if you don't know anything about Glossier then it's gonna be interesting for you but I already know a lot about it and I just recently read Glossy so it wasn't really that great in that regards 
Um, but it was a fun read and it does also go back to when I was reading the Gospel of Wellness because another thing that the author was talking about was how consumers just aren't well versed in the vernacular and the language of science so it's very easy to be manipulated. But I would have to say all of the doctors, everyone in there really did speak about the importance of washing your hands all the time pretty much however don't use antibacterial soap because you're it's not really that great for you but you don't need to shower every single day is that going to stop me no i still will continue to shower every single day because i love to shower even though i know it's really bad and makes my skin even more dry because i shower in really hot temperatures but you live in you whatever it's a decision I'm making. Sorry, I have to take a break to get more tea. Uh, let's see, next up we're gonna talk about another McNally's read. I did The Girls by John Bowen. This is a buddy read with Yahira, um, whose Instagram I'll put below. She is always reading really great stuff. So this is a book. What should I even say? Okay, this is a story about two women who are in a relationship living in an idyllic English village who murder a man. Now, it's really important that you have expectations are set. This is not a murder mystery. Not at all. Not by any stroke of imagination. This is not even that psychologically uh, tense and it's not a thriller by any stroke of the imagination. This is an exploration of rich British people, which is what I love. <laughs> Um, these two women are living in the Midlands and they're, I think the book came out in the early 80s, but it's kind of written in the late 70s. And so there's references at one point, there's a character who's a police officer, or like a sheriff or something like that. And he, the narrator tells us like what his fate is and what's going to end up happening to happening to him like a year, 10 years from now, and then ties it into the economic situation of the West Midlands. This is a book that's really looking at class in America, not in America, class in England, because these two women, these wealthy women, who though they do have a shop, they work, they own their own shop, which sells like jam and weird things that no one really needs, but they have their business. It's still running. They're not necessarily always the most just devout at it, but it's how they make their living. But they're not like the villagers who are mostly working class people and the ladies will often go to these fairs. So there's a lot about crafts. Every single, sing single thing about crafts was really kind of boring for me, but you just learn a lot about British culture and how these two ladies who are very kind of like upper echelon, not, but they're not super rich, but they're rich enough that working isn't really a big priority for them. And they're able to get by in this really cute little village Hamlet situation. And you see just an interesting story. It's about 200 pages. What I found really interesting about this was how the author would very deftly kind of make things happen. So there's a line about how at one point, one of the women goes to see her parents and her mother slaps her. And it just happens so quick, it's just so fast. And those moments of action, which come up a few times, but I don't wanna, the example that I'm thinking of, if I tell you that, it's kind of a spoiler, so I don't wanna do that for you. Those moments were the most interesting for me from a craft perspective, just to see how the author moves things along and doesn't really play with the action. He tells it to you very quickly, very fast, which I thought was interesting. And if you like books about rich British people, kind of like um, the book that I read the month prior by Elizabeth Mavor, A Green Equinox, The Green Equinox, similar vein to this. They're both kind of similar vibes, but very, very different writing styles. Then I did another buddy read. Uh, this was My Death by Lisa Tuttle. Lisa Tuttle happens to be a sci-fi writer who also used to be involved with George R.R. R. Martin. Very interesting, very fascinating. This is a slim little book, but so good, so well done. This tells the story of an author who also happens to be a widow who has kind of lost the plot when it comes to writing. She doesn't know what her next project is. She goes to a meeting with her agent and they're kind of talking that talking it out and then the words just come to her she's like i'm gonna do a biography on this woman helen helen was an muse turned author whose work really inspired her as a child so then she's doing her research she discovers a painting from the author that is very provocative and um 
sexy but also just kind of intense and dark and through that she then finds out that the author is still living so she goes to meet her and she kind of gets into this is a psych this is psychological then she finds out that this woman kind of knows a lot about her and then the book keeps on going this is it it's very meta the ending is really trippy definitely would recommend this the next thing that i read was hitchcock's blondes by lawrence lemur this book i did it on audio is an exploration of hitchcock and kind of looking at his careers the actresses that he would use what it was like working with him on set and the ways that he would kind of exert control over these women and then the author would look at what happened to their careers after they stopped working with hitchcock and like the rest of their life the author makes the um hypothesis premise whatever argument in the beginning of the book that Hitch hitchcock's mother was not a very loving woman she was blonde she was portly and it is from her that he got his weight problems and a weak chin something like that i don't know and he's the author says that because his mother was not very loving he therefore felt inclined to seek dominance over these women who were also blonde women like his mother and he just really wanted to be loved by them but because of the fact that he wasn't loved as a child uh the author does say that Hitchcock never had a romantic relationship with any of these women. He was actually a bit of a voyeur, if anything. And his control of them was more so just like in humiliating them and really working them very hard. I think it was interesting to see how Hitchcock as a director was a really intense guy. Like sometimes he would use a whole entire week to film what would end up being a one minute scene or what was going to be like only two minutes. And just that kind of dedication and the fact that, that he was able to do that is really interesting to me. But he was not a man who believed in actors. Like when actors would come to him asking for a lot of direction, he would be like, it's not that serious just read the lines, just do this, just do that. But like wouldn't give them a lot of direction unless they were messing up. He just did not place actors in very high esteem, which I thought was really interesting. It was also cool to see, very telling, I would say, to see his relationship with his wife. They were probably married for 40 years, maybe longer than that. And she was really his um, co-creator with a lot of what he did. She was the force behind it that helped to bring to life a lot of his vision. And it kind of reminded me of George Orwell and his wife, Eileen. Um, Hitchcock's wife, her name was Alma. And there's a line, I guess a speech that um, Hitchcock said, something which I thought was really kind of nice. At his Lifetime Achievement Award in 1979, this is the year before he dies, he gives a speech and he says that he wanted to thank four people. Four people who had given me the most affection, appreciation, encouragement, and constant collaboration. The first of the four is a film editor. The second is a script writer. The third is the mother of my daughter, Pat. And the fourth is as fine as a cook has ever performed miracles in a domestic kitchen. And their names are Alma. So sweet. You have that. He knows that Alma is really the woman who is helping him and making everything possible. But then at the same time, he was really dismissive and mean about women and sometimes Alma. So you have that contradiction. You see a lot of that. You see how Hitchcock was someone who really loved practical jokes and had always been a bit of a jokester since he was a kid. And he could be really cross and crude, especially to women. He loved to make them uncomfortable. And some of the women who... Um, were able to work with him the longest would kind of just like let these comments fly over them but there sometimes were women maybe it was grace kelly where he like wouldn't say those kinds of jokes in front of her because there's just something in her aura i don't think it was grace kelly it was someone else um whose name i'm forgetting right now i'm so sorry but read the book you'll find out and the next two books that i read were also fiction books one of them was uh what the world what whoa. the next book that i read was about owls it's called what the owl knows the new science of the world's most enigma enigmatic birds so Lots to dissect. I didn't really know a lot about owls beforehand and this was interesting. You find out that because owls are such a quiet creature that a lot, there's just not a lot that we know about them but what we have learned is really interesting. Turns out that what we thought was like certain species are actually could be separated even further. We find out how smart they are and it's just really cute, super adorable. You find out about their brain size and their ears are like really big and take up like most of their head. Like let's say if I, this was an owl head, the ear goes from like here to there and these weird slits. And it was kind of scary to find out some of that stuff, but super interesting, very engaging. You find out about their migration habits and um, just so cute and so cool. And I really liked it a lot. And 
Um, there was more that I wanted to say, but it's kind of escaping me about the owls, the cute little owls. Oh, um, owls are very individualized, though they can act like as communities. You find out about how they're mating with people, not people, how they're mating with other owls, what that situation is like. You find out about their feathers and the density of them and why it is that they are able to fly so silently. There's a little bit of cultural stuff where you find out how, you know, for certain reasons, owls are considered bad in this culture, good in this culture, and for what reason. It's just a fun little read if you've ever, you've probably seen it in bookstores. I've seen it in Barnes & Noble like a bunch, but it was a cool read. You do also at the same time then come away from it being like, we really don't know a lot when it comes to science. Like there's so much to be discovered, so much to learn. Um, there's also something about how owls actually need to sleep with both eyes closed, but they can sleep with one eye open if they're like trying to suss out the situation, but they don't sleep as deeply. And it was just, Fun, cool. Next thing I read after that was another nonfiction book. This is called How to Change by Katie Milkman, which is the study of habits. And as we are coming to the end of the year, I thought I would read this little book, see what's up, see what's happening. If I'm to be quite honest with you, I do think that a lot of what you find in this book, you probably already know if you spend any time on the internet or reading these kinds of things. So it's just like cool to see it all in one place, but at the same time, this could have been an article. And my other critique of the book is that a lot of the examples that were used were about weight loss and exercise routines and like <laughs> stuff about exercise and maintaining a habit in that regard. And I did not find that useful in any capacity for me. I think that the author at the very beginning, and I had this complaint with another book that I read this month in December, the author should have at the very beginning included a section about their personal bias because this book when there were examples included, most of it was about exercise and none of my habits involve exercise, eating, anything like that. So I found that to be really frustrating because you do want sometimes like examples of how you could execute this in your personal life. But when everything is centered on how to maintain a gym habit, it's like, I don't fucking care. This doesn't concern me. This is a you issue. So <laughs> that was my one critique. Something that you do find out from the book is the reason why New Year's can be really helpful for so many people and New Year's, birthdays, start of the school year, that kind of stuff is because people do not view time very linear, linearly. They view it episodic. So having that opportunity for a fresh start is super helpful when you're trying to implement a new habit. Likewise, there was other stuff. I actually like took notes and then I shared them to my sister. So I was giving a seminar if you wanted to know. So let me go back to my notes. Habits come from routine building. It's really helpful to do habit stacking. You know, it sounds so gross saying because I'm like flashback to so many TikToks I've come across of people being like, habit stacking is the key to everything. It probably definitely is. But let's say, for example, I think most of us can safely say that we wake up every morning, we brush our teeth. And let's say there's something else, another habit you want to implement. Maybe it's using Duol Duolingo. So what you could do is brush your teeth. And then immediately after you're done brushing your teeth, you go to your phone, you do Duolingo. And you're building that habit, making it so that it's more likely than not that you would follow through with it because you're connecting it to a habit that you're already doing. Another thing that she talks about is how it's really important if you're like maintaining consistent routines, but at the same time, you do need to be just a little bit flexible because it's easy to be like, okay, I skipped one day of a workout. Oh my God, sorry to go there. I skipped one day of reading. So the second day, oh, whatever, like I missed yesterday. I'll just miss it again today, whatever. But that does add up so that the time lengthens. But instead what you could do, and she gives the example of her friend who was a runner who would be like, it's really important to me that I run every single day. However, in a week, I gave myself two free days as a pass. And these are like days that I can use um, like the opportunity if an emergency arises that I won't need to run but I find out that just by having that little bit of flexibility that little bit of wiggle room that grace actually makes it so that this woman would end up running pretty much every single day most weeks and so that's something to consider if you're dealing with issues with your habit and you want to do something every single day but there obviously there are times where something pops up you have a headache or an emergency and you just can't do whatever it is that you wanted to do. Another thing that this person, this author, uh, wanted to deal with is that this was really interesting. It turns out that giving unsolicited advice to someone when they're in the process of creating a habit is not helpful because for that person who's on the receiving end of the advice, it actually comes off as really demoralizing and actually like knocks them off their confidence and makes it harder for them to execute on that because it feels like an attack versus like if that person were to go to you actively seeking advice. And so the, and then the final kind of things that she says is that um, 
through osmosis, a lot of the times you pick up habits from your peers, from your peers and your friend groups. And if you want to implement a new habit, it would actually be helpful to look at your friends and see who is amongst your friend group, someone who's kind of similar to you, who's doing that and just going to them and proactively asking them, Hey, how is it possible that you're able to do X when you're so busy? Like what, what's going, like, can you help me understand this? And you can then proactively kind of mirror them and make it more feasible that you would do that habit. The kind of final thing that she goes from there is that confidence is key when it comes to making change. And it's really important to have identity based habits. Like if you say to yourself, I'm a reader versus I'm someone who sometimes reads, you are more likely to act like a reader if you believe your core identity is someone who's a reader. So that was that book. It might be something you want to check out, do it on audio, bang through it, get some details on some info on how to execute on habits. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up. That was my month of reading in November, 100 books achieved. We're in the final month of the year, God willing. I read more than, I don't know, maybe 110 books. Is that feasible? Is that possible? Can we make it happen? I would love to hear what you read in November, what you really liked, if any of these books that I read are of interest to you. And with that, I will see you guys later.